Briefly, such interests draw together various aspects of computer-mediated communication um, involving language and gender, really, with a particular focus on storytelling, both in literature and conversation, but also in social, social media contexts. Um, she's considered how gender can influence the style of storytelling in these media, um, for example. Um, and she's related this to work in um, feminist narratology. Um, her recent CUP monograph, Narratives Online, um, it's focused on the way shared stories are circulated on social media platforms, but also on sites such as Wikipedia. Um, and she's shown that these stories are amenable to mediated narrative analysis. Um, in her most recent work, she's outlined a multimodal framework um, that reveals how the visual, aural, and verbal resources of video-based communications can create a form of synthetic collectivism. Um, so, we're very grateful to you for being here. And over to you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for coming back after lunch. Um, I hope I'm going to keep you awake. I know this is the time of day at which I normally feel like it might be quite nice to have a little bit of a siesta. Um, I'm also really conscious that my work is really quite different from the work that you've heard about this morning. I'm primarily uh, a discourse analyst. Um, much more qualitative than the work that you've heard about this morning. And also, as my title suggests, we're not just going to be talking about words, we're also going to be talking about images and looking at a very specific form of social media, um, which you don't can't see on the screen yet, but I will tell you about shortly, which is Instagram. So this is what I am hoping that we will be able to do in the next 25 minutes. And I'm just going to set my alarm going, <laughs> just so that we will all wake up in 25 minutes if the worst comes to the worst. Um, so I would also say that my perspective on gender is also quite different from what you've heard about this morning too. Um, we're going to talk about ugliness. Um, I bet you weren't expecting that. Um, then Instagram and why I think this is really important. So, um, so I say I'm, I'm a discourse analyst. So when I teach my students about gender, teacher module on language and gender, for example, I try very much to get them to think about gender in a much more flexible way than the ways that we've um, talked about it in terms of the categories between this is male, this is female, um, largely because of the uh, work that began to emerge in the 1990s, which was much more kind of postmodern approach to gender. Um, I really love the paper by Bing and Bergvall, which is, you know, how much of the results that we've seen, the work that was coming out in the 1980s, comes because of the questions we've asked of that data. And if those questions presuppose difference, well, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find difference. Um, and they point out that actually, as that nice picture of the sunset, um, suggests that actually much of our experience doesn't fit into categories very neatly. Actually, sometimes it's much more nuanced than that. Um, so you can see that in terms of new media context, you might remember when Facebook made the decision to change the choice of pronouns that could be used to um, for different kinds of gender identification to allow that kind of more flexible identification. Also, in terms of thinking about the kind of online context that I'm interested in, one of the things that uh, kind of gets teased out in all sorts of different ways is the way that the gendered identities that you see performed in online contexts might or might not match up with those that are being performed in other kinds of contexts. So you might remember um, back in 2011, the blog Gay Girl in Damascus, um, which during the 2011 uprising, the Post claimed that Amina, the blogger, who self-identified as a female lesbian, had been abducted. Um, it turned out that this blog was actually a fictional creation that had been written by an American postgraduate, Tom McMaster. More recently, if you watch television like the series, the catfishing series here, Circle, you might remember that the person who actually won it was a person called Alex, who posed as a girl, Kate. Um, and you might remember that in both of these two instances, although we see that there's this possibility for playful uh, decoupling of different kinds of gendered identities, the social reactions to these two instances showed us that actually there are still very strong societal expectations of authenticity, that who you present yourself to be in an online context is also who you present yourself to be in an offline context. So. How does, this, how does discourse analysis sort of approach that? 
Well, in computer-mediated discourse analysis, I spend a lot of time saying to students, don't just interpret what you're seeing in terms of gender. Very often, the kinds of explanations that you might um, be able to reach in terms of the patterns that you see in data are not just because somebody is masculine or feminine. It might be related to a whole range of other contextual factors. So, for example, in my work on cancer blogs, or for example, in the very early work that I did about um, childbirth narratives, the gendered stars in storytelling weren't so much to do with somebody being male or female, but because of the communities of practice that arose around those different kinds of participants. Also, uh, I try and encourage myself and my students to have a more kind of intersectional approach to gender, which is not just to see gender alone as the explanation for the possible patterns you might see in data, but to also see the way that it might relate to age or nationality, for example. And to bear in mind that, as we've already talked about a little bit this morning, that genre makes a difference as well. So um, Herring and Paolo's paper, which I think might have been up on the screen or might not have been up on the screen, they really started to contest some of the work that said that from a comp computational point of view, you could just simply say, this is written by a woman, this is written by a man, that once you controlled for for genre, those gender differences started to disappear. So all of this, well, where does that leave us in this picture of complexity? If we're finding more similarity than difference, if gender is discursively constructed, if it's not really about being male or female, that's all about language. But when we look outside the studies that look at discourse in terms of the verbal content of discourse, you start to see a much more a binary approach to gender that starts to look much more for patterns of difference. So looking outside computer mediated discourse analysis itself to studies that come more from the social sciences, we find, for example, Thelwell's study looking at image sharing practices across different um, platforms and finding that females shared more images overall, they shared more photos on Snapchat than on Twitter, and they tended to be more concerned with liking and commenting, for example. We also find that in uh, studies that have been doing uh, content analysis of Instagram or Instagram images, they too have found actually very strong patterns of gender stereotypes in the content of the images, um, specifically feeding through into particular kinds of content in Instagram that Instagram is particularly you know, notorious for the so-called fitspiration, thinspiration um, trends in Instagram which simply reproduce certain kinds of gendered stereotypes that you find in adverts where you see um, the kind of muscular muscularity and masculinity and the thin toned femininity being reproduced in those images. And also in studies in psychology, this pattern of gender difference that's looking particularly at kind of a binary way of thinking about gender, they too have identified um, Instagram as being um, a significant site that shows up difference in the way that the, the, the meanings and the social cycle, so, psycho social effects of the image sharing has on certain groups, again, is quite gendered. They found, for example, that female adolescents had significantly higher scores on all of their studies compared to the males, which was in line with um, higher reported use, higher problematic social media use by young women, higher body image dissatisfaction, depression, general anxiety and social anxiety. And we know from some of the literature in mental health that gender also makes a difference. For example, that eating orders tend to affect young women and gay men more than they affect, affect heterosexual men. And we know that there is also a rising uh, concern about the increased rates of suicide for young men. So we have this complex picture where me as a discourse analyst is saying gender doesn't really matter, it's really discursive, it's being constructed in all these different ways. And then we have this other set of research from the social sciences is saying actually in terms of the real world consequences and the practices that are going on, there are socially um, and gendered patterns that are going on in how people are using the images, what it means for them in their day to day life, which have um, very significant real world consequences. So Instagram is my focus today. Um, so Instagram as a site for gendered display includes a whole range of material which goes right the way through from kind of hegemonic masculinity. So on the far, oh, I don't know how to make this point. Over here, you have bits of Instagram. And in the middle, you have gym lad. And then to the right, you have hashtag drag queens. And on the far right hand side of the screen, you have hashtag 
like a girl, which is kind of mocking or contesting different kinds of femininity. So I'm going to preface all that I'm going to say next with the caveat that there's a whole diverse range of kind of gendered identities within Instagram, which I can't possibly in the space of 20 minutes talk to you in a satisfactory way about. So I'm going to narrow down to look at a very particular part of it and talk about ugliness. Well, I thought I should explain, like many things in my life, comes back to my family. And this image here, I have permission to show you this. The reason that I don't have uh, many images of the selfies in the uh, rest of my presentations because I don't have informed consent to show you everything that I've looked at. This is my beautiful daughter. Um, this is a birthday collage that was um, made by her, one of her best friends and posted on her Facebook timeline when she turned 18 um, nearly two years ago. And I looked at this and went, what is that about? because I would never take a picture of myself like that and send it to anybody. So I was like, what is this about? And I started to talk to my students about their selfie taking practices and what it meant to them. And these kinds of pictures that you can see in the bottom left center at the top and the far right hand bottom are snaps, um, so-called ugly selfies. And that's what started me getting interested in. What are ugly selfies? What are they being used for in people's relationships? What are the kinds of discourses that are emerging around them? So that is why I'm doing what I'm doing, because like most things in my life, it comes back to my family, as well as being very socially important, of course, and intrinsically, intellectually stimulating. I hope I'm going to prove to you. <laughs> we'll see. OK, there we go. All right, so what do I mean by ugliness 2.0? Well, <clears throat> in my exploration of, first of all, ugly selfies and then ugly kinds of images, I have come to the conclusion that the discourses around ugliness are shifting in social media and being used for a whole kind of complex array of meanings. And that these are used as part of gendered displays. So I want to persuade you this afternoon that ugliness 2.0 is both an aesthetic, affective and moral form of evaluation that is used to negotiate interpersonal relationships and is constructed as an embodied attribute on Instagram. So I started off looking at ugly selfies, the kinds of images that I just showed you of my daughter um, there. Um, and I then suddenly thought, oh, I'm not really sure this is the only kind of ugliness because it's a very particular kind of construction of ugliness. So I started to gather data also with the hashtag ugly. And what I discovered was that actually ugliness has what I describe as a long tail. So you have at one end of the spectrum, a kind of playful construction of ugliness going through to what you might call a very painful construction of ugliness. And these posts vary in all kinds of interesting ways. And so what I did when Marcus invited me to come and give this talk was then to tap into this data and say, what are the gendered patterns in this data set? So just to show you a little bit what I mean about the ugliness being different in these two data sets, which we can think of not quite as two genres, but two definite distinct constructions of ugliness. So I said I'm a qualitative researcher, but I did my undergraduate degree at Birmingham, which means that you have to know about corpus linguistics and use that a little bit somewhere. Um, so when I gathered my data, what I did was I did, um, uh, uh, basically I did keyword search and then I did a collocational search for ugly within these two um, hashtag threads. And you can see that for the hashtag ugly thread, the strongest collocates are fat, sad, worthless, depressed, alone, depression. I think you'll agree these are fairly negative, um, strongly loaded with negative effect. Not the case for ugly selfie at all. What we see is bored. Um, there's a reason that you see blue eyes there. I haven't got time to talk to you about it today, but you can see this is much more bored, funny, self-mocking, and that comes through in the collocates there. So <sighs> these two types of ugliness then, we don't know anything about the gender yet, but what's been interesting in terms of the me mainstream media coverage of these types of ugliness is that they strongly are positioning this in kind of gendered terms where it's particularly associated with young women. So in terms of the playful forms of ugliness, the mainstream media are interested in this as a kind of feminist reaction that's pushing back against beauty ideals. In terms of the painful forms of ugliness, it's 
associated with the controversies that you'll be well aware of at the moment in terms of mental health, eating disorders and accessing um, fairly, uh, I would call it toxic content on Instagram and, and the effect that that has on well-being for young people. So we would suspect that from the media coverage there would be some kind of gendered differences in the way that you would see ugliness constructed in these different data sets. Um, you might expect that from the literature in psychology and social sciences. From a linguistic perspective, would you expect to see the differences? Don't know. Let me show you what I found. So this, as I say, is a case study in Instagram. To tell you specifically what I did, first of all, I gathered two sets of data, um, two 1,000 sets of Instagram posts, one hashtag ugly and the other hashtag ugly selfie. They were extracted in June and then September last year using the tool Netlytic, which you should then work for extracting data from Instagram. What Netlytic does is it gathers for you the caption. It used to gather the comments. It doesn't gather the image. You have to go back and look at the image separately, which is also important because from ethical point of view and legal point of view and GDR, GDPR point of view, you don't have the rights to take the image. You have to look at them separately and annotate the image separately, which is also another reason that I'm not showing you any images today because it's complicated. So what I did was annotate this data set using the NCAPTCHA facility in NVivo. Um, oh, for all of you who are into quantitative approaches, just forgive me for the uneven numbers there. They're basically a result of what happens when you take away the noise in the data set. That's what I was left with. Um, so uh, what I did was to do a corpus linguistic analysis of the captions actually of the whole data set looking at the frequency of particular items in the collocations. I then went back and painstakingly went through every single flipping post, looking at the identity that was signalled um, for the post owner. Then I did some analysis of the images using inductive categories, which were partly derived from Goffman's work, looking at the face and body display, looking at eye gaze and mouth expression drawing on the work from Ekman. Um, and I coded that according to the individual person within an image, not the number of images itself. So if you see that the numbers don't match up, that is why. Okay, so to talk us through the verbal positioning first. <coughs> so these, this is an analysis um, of the lemmas associated with the items here. So it's not just the word girl, it could be um, fangirl, um, emo girl, um, girlfriend, it could be all of the uh, um, lemmas associated with girl, boy, woman, man, men, so on and so forth. Um, so these were the categories that I knew were in the data because I'd looked at all of the posts. Um, and so then I searched for the terms in the captions and then I calculated their frequency to a relative frequency per million words to normalise it. And what you can see here is the following. That you can see that binary gendered positioning is more frequently used in non-binary categories and that the positions associated with young female identities are much more frequently used than young men. So, for example, if you compare girl and boy, and you can see that that's really strongly marked for um, ugly selfie. Um, but even for ugly, it's twice as often um, used for girl as for boy. You can also see that um, intersectionality is important here because if you look, for example, at the difference between girl and boy and woman and man, you can see that man is more frequent than woman. It's the opposite pattern to the girl and boy. Um, you can also see this really interesting why gay is so hugely, hugely co um, um, present in the data for the ugly selfies it becomes a little bit more apparent when you look at the collocational spans for those words. And what you can see is that it's particularly associated with um, boy. Um, what you see in terms of the collocations for um, just the ugly data is that you can see that there's a strong suggestion here already that there are kind of mental health concerns coming through for girls, but not for boys. That doesn't mean that they're not there for the boys. It just means that the way that the hashtags and the captions are being used in a way, the most searchable part of Instagram that drives the algorithms that seems to be feeding something that's tapping into something that's um, a gendered pattern. OK, so do we see this simply because there are loads more young girls in taking these creating these posts than the boys? Well, the answer is yes, but no. 
Um, so we do see that in terms of the account owners for uh, both the ugly and the ugly selfie posts, that there are more um, female identified names than male identified names, because I don't know whether they really are identifying as masculine or feminine in terms of offline content, but context. Um, but this difference is nowhere near as big as the difference in the hashtags would have you believe. So you could see if you had the same proportionate difference for the um, that you saw in the hashtags, you'd expect to see double the number of female posts or three times the number of female account holders. You're not seeing that, which suggests either that the content that these people are posting is different and the hashtags are relating to the content, not to the account owner, or that women and men, young women and men, are using hashtags differently to each other and that women are using much more of the hashtags than the young men are. So is it to do with the content? Okay, what you see here, so what I did was to, um, first of all, just see what is in the data. Is this a picture that shows a woman? Is this a picture that shows a man? Is it a meme? Is it a verbal mean? Is it a visual mean? Is it a picture that shows both women and men? Is it some kind of art? Is it something else? Um, and this is what you see the results of in front of you. And what you see here is not very surprising, given what I've already shown you, that there are more images that represent women than men, and that this is more strongly pronounced for ugly selfies than it is for the hashtag ugly. ugly. Not surprising, given that they're ugly selfies and so more likely to be pictures of people. But what happens when we disaggregate it, according to the account owner? Again, not hugely surprising. What you see here is that the male account owners post pictures of men. The female account owners page post pictures of women. What you can see is that women tend to post more verbal memes and the male account owners tend to um, post more visual memes. That is also typical of more general social media practices. You can see that in terms of uh, these, the accounts where you couldn't tell the gender of the person at all. Likewise, they also hide their, they don't give you any indexing clue in terms of their gendered identity, in terms of the content. That was where you most often saw the visual and verbal means and art was shared out um, equally amongst them all. So where do we go from here? Is this just, well, yes, women are showing more pictures of themselves than men do. Um, well, what I did next was to, one of the things that was really interesting to me in the data was the way that um, how much you saw somebody's face um, varied in the two sets of data. So for the ugly, Im ugly selfies, what you tend to see is a person taking an image up close, very close to themselves. What you tended to see more of in the ugly images was somebody cutting off their face obscuring their face in some way, obscuring the face by taking a mirror selfie and using the flash to obscure the face, blacking out the face, in some way hiding the face, creating a kind of distancing effect. So what I did was to analyse both how much the body was shown and how much the face was shown. So what we want to say, what I want to tell you from this slide is that actually what you see is that there's not a huge amount of gender difference, really. Even if you applied a statistical test to it, you don't see anything statistically significant according to gender. You do see more difference between the two types of ugliness. So it's a bit like the question we were, being, we were asking this morning in terms of if you took something other than reviews or if you refined your findings according to the type of review, would those gender differences disappear? <clears throat> well, this suggests maybe you would. Likewise, in terms of how much somebody's face is shown, here you can see, again, there's more similarity between the women and men in the two data sets, and the, it's the two different types of ugliness that make a difference. Um, you might suggest that perhaps women are cropping out their face more, but these are really small numbers. You'd have to do huge amounts more data before you could say that that was statistically significant in any way. And what's interesting about this is that actually it's at odds with other research that's been done. So Susan Herring back in 2011 was studying profile pictures on um, chat, internet chat. And she argued that there was gender difference found in the social difference of the subject, that the men tended to look, um, uh, tended, tended to be more withdrawn and the women were more interpersonally engaged in their pictures. Um, 
you don't see that so much in the data here. In fact, you possibly see the opposite thing happening. That's possibly because I'm looking at a very different kind of picture here. I'm not looking at profile pictures of the idealized self. I'm looking at very non-idealized self. So that might be why we're seeing the difference. Don't know. The next thing I did was to drill down into the facial expression itself to look at eye direction and gender. Again, this is premised on the fact that in earlier research, there have been differences found in terms of eye gaze. So for example, that um, uh, males would be looking away more and women would look, be looking more directly at the camera. But what you can see here is not only do you have more or less picture of similarity, both in terms of the micro feature, in terms of the eye gaze, you also see that there's actually quite a lot of similarity between the two bits of the data set altogether. So difference seems to be coming less and less important. And similarly, the case with mouth expression. So we see similarity between the two types of ugliness we see a little bit of difference according to the um, gender that women smile more than men. Again, that's been documented in other research and that men use a neutral mouth expression more. And this was uh, more marked in the ugly data. But again, these are very small differences. So in the discourse analysis, a lot of what we argue is that you don't really tend to see difference when you look at micro linguistic features. What you tend to see is much more difference when you look at pragmatic strategy and how people are socially interacting with each other. So I thought, well, I wonder if that is the case here also. And actually, you're not seeing difference in terms of micro linguistic features that you might be able to calculate algorithms for. But the way these things are combined might create kind of different kinds of discourses or pragmatic meanings. Um, but basically, what you see here is a little bit surprising, given what you find in the existing pragmatic research, which is for ugly selfies, actually, the guys are doing an awful lot of self-deprecation here, which is not what you'd expect. You'd expect the girls to be doing that more. So you're seeing something quite different there. What you do see is that girls are doing more self-mockery than the guys are. Again, the reverse of what, you have, was, what has been documented in earlier literature. But when we get to the ugly data, um, what you see is that self-deprecation evens itself out. Um, what you see is that it's young women who seem to be using their images more to convey meanings associated with mental health. So particularly eating disorders, um, where they will show um, pictures of their um, very thin bodies um, and where they will uh, show images of cutting um, and self-harm. That's the other reason they are not in images in here, because they are quite distressing. So let me close by rapidly going through my uh, closing points. So in terms of how and when gender matters, if we look at visual resources, the gender differences occur perhaps more at the discourse level, but the gender differences disappear when you look at the individual elements of the facial expression. We perhaps might extrapolate from this that these are perhaps different kinds of gendered responses to beauty ideals for women in particular, because the self-mockery self images actually causes their face to become disproportionately larger. It looks, makes them look um, fatter rather than slimmer, whereas the mental health images do the opposite thing. In fact, they remove the face altogether. Um, and they show the body to be thinner. So it seems that there's a particular kind of beauty ideal for women that has been particularly responded to here. And that the hashtags that I showed you at the beginning, or those patterns, perhaps suggest that actually young women are making this much more visible than the men are, which is potentially um, something we might want to think about how that is addressed and what we might want to do about this. Doesn't mean that we should ignore what's happening with the masculine identities being constructed here. It's just that they don't show up in such easily quantifiable ways. Um, why does this matter? It matters hugely because of what happens in the real world in relation to these images. Um, it shows us that in terms of if we're going to understand what's happening with these images and the effects that they have on young people, we need to look at the visual analysis, not just verbal analysis. Um, we need to be really careful about a binary approach to gender, but there's some suggestion that it's still there and important. It's really important because of the way that young people feel about themselves and the catalytic effect that these images could have in terms of the actions that they then take and the way that it positions with them within relational networks of support. But to get to that, you have to work in interdisciplinary teams. So the work that I'm doing at the moment is to collaborate with psychologists 
um, in particular to uh, do much more participant-centered work and to move away from just looking at the screen to understand what this means for young people um, and in terms of what they believe that they're doing and what it seems to be doing in terms of their, um, the relational impacts for different groups of participants. So that is it. Um, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you.